just to orient you a bit, the Des Moines River is uh, one of three rivers that we call the three sisters, the Collange, Noir, and Des Moines. Uh, it's uh, one of about 10 tributaries of the Ottawa River. And uh, to the best of my knowledge, it's the only river that is a major tributary of the Ottawa that is not dammed or settled at the mouth. The first uh, recreational canoe trip uh, sponsored by a, a boys camp that I know of was Camp Kiwaden in 1906. Now I'm sure that there was lots of uh, First Nation recreational paddling going on, but it was more of a lifestyle. So this is a picture that uh, I can't claim is from uh, Camp Kiwaden's 1906 trip, but I do know that they used birch bark canoes and I do recognize this rapid as possibly being the uh, on the Des Moines River. The Des Moines River, of course, was uh, formed in part by uh, glaciation, uh, the runoff from glaciation. The, there's only two times in, in uh, history that we know that the mouth of the river was flooded underwater. Uh, the first time was uh, when Lake Champlain uh, was ascending the Ottawa River, it did reach, uh, as far as we're, we know, it did reach the height of the Des Moines River and flooded into the uh, mouth of the river. Today, if you look uh, from the, uh, the entrance to the village of the Swisha, there is a large hydro dam, the top left corner of your of your photo, you're looking up a large lake called Holden Lake, which is all flood water created by the building of this dam. And of course, the mouth of the river, if you look at the bottom right picture, the mouth of the river is now flooded all the way up to uh, four kilometers up to uh, a place called Ryan Chute. Now, if you had photographs, and we do, of uh, the river prior to uh, the building of the dam. This is the, what the rapids looked like uh, where the dam is now. So the rapids were called Gouchewashem because there was uh, two portages involved in going around them. And if you looked at a air photo in 1939 of the mouth of the Des Moines, it would look like this. There was no flood water. There was a large sand beach and trading post and there was four kilometers of class two three white water uh, below the last portage ryan chute all the way out to the ottawa river going back to the earliest paddlers of course uh, this was the first nations and uh, contrary to uh, some people's belief it was a very well developed system of uh, transportation and trading that was involved with the different First Nations. But as you can see in blue here, the Ottawa River route was marked as the number one principal trade route between, between districts. So I just want to emphasize that uh, prior to European contact, there was a huge amount of traffic going up and down the Ottawa River and the Des Moines River. Of course, the first nation that had Ottawa River watershed uh, there, which is nice to I would just ask um, everyone to turn the mic on you. I'm trying to find who has the mic. Jean Francois, uh, oui? I think it's Dan's iPhone. And you can click on the three dots and mute him. Oui, j'essaie de la trouver. Ah, voilà, c'est fait. Merci yeah. beaucoup pour le conseil. Thank you, merci. Okay, <laughs> good. So the Algonquin uh, tribe, the Algonquin Nation, First Nation uh, had the whole Ottawa River watershed as its uh, territory. Uh, and uh, within that territory, uh, each of the major tributaries uh, had a group of families that claimed those tributaries as their hunting territory. So the Des Moines River Band would have claimed the Des Moines River as their territory within the Algonquin Nation. 
We know how that worked because uh, in uh, 1912, an anthropologist named Frank Speck interviewed some of the last survivors from the Des Moines River Band and got a complete description of the different families that had divided the Des Moines River watershed up as their family hunting territories, hunting and trapping territories. So there was about nine families involved. Each family would have about uh, maybe 10 to 20 people. And awesome. each family would have upwards of 800 square miles as their hunting and trapping territory. It was their definition of property rights, though they, the uh, Algonquin nation did not believe in property per se as ownership, but this was their responsibility to manage that hunting and fishing territory in perpetuity. The Des Moines band after the uh, logging industry disrupted their ability to hunt and trap and fish, kept on moving further and further north and eventually joined with the Wolf Lake First Nation. So that today, this is unceded territory that belongs to the Wolf Lake First Nation. The lower left is a picture of uh, Paul Chevalier and his wife, Susan. Uh, they were living in the little village of Rapide de Chachain in 1912, having left the watershed as did most of the band dispersing either north or south. And this is a picture of him uh, with his grandfather's medal. His grandfather was awarded that medal by uh, uh, Queen Victoria for being such a valiant uh, soldier in the War of 1812. So the family ties were uh, spectacular. At the headwaters of the Des Moines, the headwaters are actually a little further north, but this is a uh, air photo of Lac Des Moines. And in the, uh, in the translation of the Algonquin name for Lac Des Moines, it would translate into go home or go back lake. And the reason for that was that from every direction you could take a different route to link up with another river system that would link you to uh, the Kalunge or to the uh, James Bay watershed or the Kippewa watershed or go out the south to Lac Des Moines. So it had the four cardinal directions linking it uh, to uh, anywhere you wanted to go. So it was, it was a, uh, a major turnpike, a major uh, changing zones lake in the, uh, in the milieu of uh, La Verandre Kippewa as we know it today. So that was the headwaters. And this of course, as I showed you was the, uh, the mouth of the Des Moines and in between was uh, about 70 kilometers of whitewater and some placid water that today is a beautiful canoe trip. But the history at the headwaters, Lac Des Moines and at the mouth is just full of unique reflections of Canadian history. The beginning of the campsite at the mouth of the Des Moines, which unfortunately is underwater today, so you can't really see it, but you have to imagine it when you paddle on the Des Moines. It was a major fishing place. There were a few crops growing, though the Algonquins were not known for growing crops. And there was a lot of trading that took place from different uh, First Nations that would go up and down the Ottawa River. This would be prior to European contact. So we know this because uh, uh, the nature of similar uh, trading and uh, sandy campsites along the Ottawa River that still exist have this same reputation. So fishing would be done by either building weir nets or by spear fishing. And uh, uh, sometimes uh, a torch was used to attract the fish at night. Of course, the first European contact occurred in the Gulf of St. Lawrence with Jacques Cartier, but uh, the first European contact that went up the Ottawa River as, and past the Des Moines would be uh, emissaries sent by Samuel Champlain 
people like Brule, Etienne Brule, preceded Champlain up the Ottawa River. And everybody that came back to Champlain would describe to him uh, what the lay of the land was uh, on the route up the Ottawa River. And Champlain would take all of these notes and he would send them back to France and cartographers in France would draw the first maps that showed the Des Moines River. This is the Des Moines here. And of course, from descriptions that Etienne Brule would have gotten and other emissaries from the Algonquins, they would, as they were passing the Des Moines, they would say, yes, you can go up that river all the way to the headwaters and take another river down to Trois Rivières. So generally they had the lay of the land correct. Uh, Everybody that paddled up the Ottawa River had this same view that we had up prior to the building of the dam. So one of the most famous people that uh, your club is named after, of course, is uh, Pierre Radisson and his brother-in-law, Monsieur Grossier. Uh, I really recommend if you're interested in the subject that you uh, get this book called Bush Runner and read about his life. It's very interesting. What is interesting about uh, Radisson and Grossier is uh, they were one of the first to break a, a barricade uh, put up by the Iroquois all along the Ottawa River. Every portage was a battle zone and uh, a good chance that you would be attacked as you portaged across all of the portages along the Ottawa River. So it was. Uh, these two gentlemen who broke the barricade by uh, putting a flotilla of almost a hundred canoes together with all the furs they'd captured over two years and uh, broke the flotilla going back to Montreal. Of course, there was one little problem with that. They were considered outlaws for doing that. They didn't have a license to go and trade. So in 1645, uh, approximately when they did that, the, uh, the map of New France would look like this, all the blue area with the 13 colonies down here. By 1745, all the French explorers had explored all the way down the Mississippi, right to New Orleans and way out past Winnipeg, people like uh, Lavarandre and Roberval. It was a, a huge, uh, busy transportation route past the mouth of Des Moines in the 1600s and 1700s. The uh, building of the first uh, freighter canoes uh, took place around 1700 and allowed further and further explorations. And this is an example of a canoe that would have been built around Trois Rivières. And uh, this would have been the uh, Canoe de Maitre. So when the British uh, defeated the uh, French, uh, the map of North America would have had a, a large contingent of United States. Most of it was still under Spanish rule. So this would be Texas and California and all those places. And then uh, Rupert's land was, was not considered part of uh, uh, the new Quebec as it was owned by Hudson Bay Company, but uh, Quebec itself would be uh, all of this red area that we see here. Of course, uh, people that played a big role in opening up the Des Moines River and, uh, and the trade routes were the priests. They were trading in souls. They were trying to convert everybody to um, Catholicism. So it was the Jesuits and the Reclettes and uh, the Seputians, and then uh, the final uh, um, most uh, stable group was the Oblates. And uh, they would travel up the Ottawa River all the way to a mission house on Grand Lake, Victoria. And uh, there are many journals of them doing that whole route in five days. Now I've tried to do the whole route just up to Lac Des Moines and it took me five days. So. Uh, I don't know how these guys did it, but it, they were pretty tough guys back then. This is the picture that was used on, uh, on the advertising for tonight's show. And I, I like to feature it because 
you might notice two large rolls of birch bark here in the middle of this canoe. This canoe is traveling between the fort at Grand Lake Victoria through Lac Des Moines over to Kippewa with some trade goods and trading in birch bark to build uh, birch bark canoes in areas where there was not birch bark of a large enough size growing, such as James Bay, was a very big trade commodity that came up the Des Moines from Algonquin uh, Park area and up the Des Moines to Grand Lake Victoria and was traded further north. It was, uh, it doesn't get much mentioned, but it was a very large and interesting trade commodity. Of course, we have some beautiful images of uh, the life of the voyageurs. Now, when the British took over, they really developed the commercial aspect of trading. And uh, they would travel in huge brigades from uh, Montreal to the tip of uh, Lake Superior. And it's very likely that they at least took a smoke pipe break at the mouth of the Des Moines. They did this about every uh, two hours. And uh, it was a tradition that, uh, that marked the mileage of uh, the voyageurs uh, travels. Most of the people uh, are more familiar with uh, Francis Hopkins paintings of the voyageurs. And rather than look at the whole painting, I often like to cut it up and look at the details that are that are in these characters. They're, they're very well done and they tell you a lot about what was happening at the time at the mouth of the Des Moines. That's a picture of Frances Hopkins. She herself did the Ottawa River past uh, the portage at Rapid de Washington and past the mouth of the Des Moines four times. I would think she would often stop for the night at uh, Rapid de Washington. There was a beautiful hotel there for its time. And I would often think that she would probably stop for a, uh, a break at the mouth of the Des Moines because it was the first place after the portage that was really accessible for uh, stretching your legs. We have several maps that show the mouth of Des Moines and how it was developed. Of course, this is the 1939 air photo, but there is an 1852 map that shows a Hudson Bay post at the mouth of Des Moines. Uh, the notes here say that this is a temporary summer trading post that tried to capture the spring fur trade that would go down the river and down the Des Moines. There was also after the abandoned fort about 1870, there was the first man that tried to make a farm there and what we call a stopping place. His name was Sweezy, uh, Benjamin Sweezy. And then the last person, the person that stayed the longest trying to make a, a, a trading business and stopping place, a stopping place is basically a crude hotel. His name was Paul Dufault. And we'll see his name come up later. In 1860, the first uh, steamship came to Rapid Washington uh, from Pembroke, linking all of uh, the Ottawa River up to Rapid Washington from Elmer. And then in 1877, a steamship was launched on the upper end of the island that would go up the uh, rest of the Ottawa River to the next barrier called uh, Roche Capitaine. And this steamship would stop often at the mouth of Des Moines and uh, let off uh, people that wanted to travel up the river by foot or by uh, logging camp. It's very interesting, and this is a new book that's out, that for years from 1850 to 1930, there was a serious proposal to uh, make a canal around each of the rapids on the Ottawa River so that steamboats could travel all the way from the St. Lawrence to Georgian Bay and further on to the Great Lakes. If you're interested in that type of here, history, this book uh, uh, by Ray Love is a really good read on, on how that all came together and fell apart again. Here's four characters that pass the mouth of Des Moines often. This is Alexander Mackenzie, so on his way to be the first man to cross North America to the Pacific. He would have crossed uh, the, 
the mouth of the Des Moines and the portage at Rapide, the Swashim. And his, uh, his journal notes actually measure how many footsteps each portage was. This gentleman is uh, George Simpson. And I highly recommend uh, Jim Raffin's book about the life of George Simpson, if uh, you're interested in reading more about him. He was the president or the general manager of the Hudson Bay Company after the merger of the Northwest Company and the Hudson Bay Company in 1821. And this gentleman here is uh, William Logan. And he was the first uh, director of Canada's uh, Mines and Technological Survey Department. And his journal, his first assignment was to go and take a survey of the Ottawa River. And that's fascinating reading as well. That's his book on the lower right, if you're looking for reading about the river in 1840. So the logging on the Des Moines River uh, began about 1840 as well. And there's three phases to the logging industry. The first one was known as the square timber era. And that's the era where they would pick the biggest pines and they would cut them down and they would square the sides of them and form them into rafts and take them to Quebec City. The second stage is called the sawmill era or the saw log era. And then that's when uh, all the sawmills at uh, Chaudière Falls here in Ottawa were created. And it made a much shorter trip to the marketplace and allowed the uh, lumberjacks to cut down smaller trees and cut them into 16 foot sections rather than these big square timbers. Uh, and that made the trip much easier and much faster. And then the final era, of course, was pulp and paper. There is still a square timber tree on the Des Moines. Uh, there's two or three of them that you can find. One of them is at the foot of Canoe Eater Rapids campsite. So all these things I'm telling you, I sort of consider them to be a history scavenger hunt on your next Des Moines trip. So here we are at the bottom of Lac Des Moines. This is Hap Wilson's map here. And if you've been to Lac Des Moines, you know you paddle right down the south end and then typically you paddle down the Des Moines River to a second lake called Lac Roulard. Well, if you have time, this map on the left, this blue one, is an 1870 map showing the first lumber camps that were on the Des Moines. So the first lumber camps were owned by the Smith Brothers and the Fraser Company. Later, this one would be owned by E.B. Eddy, and this one be owned by J.R. Booth. And there's very good evidence of those two logging camps. Even today, you can really find evidence of their existence. This at the bottom here is the timber stamp of A.J. Fraser's company. The timber, all the timber that was cut would be stamped just like branding a, a cow in the uh, Wild West. They would take a branding hammer, a stamp hammer, and hammer in a unique brand that was owned by the company that had cut the log. So this one here shows you the brand of uh, the diamond brand of J.R. Booth. And uh, if you can find a log with a brand on it, take a picture of it. And there's a book in the library that shows you every company's brand and you can identify who owned that brand. It's a little bit difficult unless the log's been dried. So your best bet is to look for deadheads with the end out of the water and you can find, uh, you can find out the odd time you can find a brand on those logs. Of course, these are the boots that the loggers use to ride the logs down the rapids and break up the log jams. They had uh, spikes or nails going through the bottom of them so they could grab hold of the wet logs and run along those logs. As you paddle out of Lac Des Moines and into the first long lake, it's called Lac La Forge. I really encourage you to try to camp at this campsite. It's a beautiful campsite with uh, a narrow isthmus uh, with a sand beach on either side. And if you walk down the shoreline right to the edge of the forest right here, you can find two remains of two old alligator boats. An alligator boat was a boat that would pull itself across the uh, 
portage trail if the portage trail was wide enough. And then when it was on water, it would pull huge booms of logs down the long flat water stretches of the river. If you'd like to read about the history of the alligator boat, this is a amazing uh, collector's book that tells you exactly what the serial number was on those two boats up on Lac La Force and when E.B. Eddy and J.R. Booth bought them and when they left them there. It's a really fascinating history. As you paddle out of Lac La Force, there's going to be two portages that's called uh, Manitou Rapids. After the second portage, take a break and walk around the big granite shoreline and you will be able to find this name carved by a logger in 1887. It's B. Paquette, P-A-Q-U-E-T-T-E. -E. I guess he was assigned here in June of 1887 to keep the logs moving through the Manitou chute. That's my guess, but he could have just done it uh, for any reason he wanted to. It also says Papano on the bottom. The name Pacat is very famous in the Ottawa River still, and uh, it'd be fun to find uh, some relative that actually knew about his grandfather working uh, and carving this initial. There's another carving on the river. It's not as old as that one. It says P-A-M 1912. So uh, it took a little while to find out who this was, but the first uh, forestry school to graduate a forestry class was the University of Laval. And they graduated nine uh, foresters and Paul Malloran was one of the graduates. And one place that you might start your Des Moines trip is at this old Bailey Bridge here. So this logging carving by Paul Malloran while he was doing his survey of the Des Moines River is just about a five minute paddle upstream on the right hand side from this bridge. Take a few minutes and go and try to find it. It's very interesting. As you travel down river, you're gonna go through uh, the longest day of, uh, of whitewater rapids. There's probably 30 sets of rapids between uh, uh, the bottom of that Bailey Bridge and the first calm water you're gonna hit. And uh, the, the only logging grave that I know of is this one, which is just above Big Steel Rapids which is the last rapids before the calm water. It says Charles Champignon, and uh, it's just up a little forest trail uh, beyond uh, a cabin that you'll see on the height of land. And you can find that, uh, that graveyard there. This is a very, uh, this style of building a cross is very familiar in uh, many graveyards uh, all across Ontario and Quebec. And it, it was a little bit unusual even that they, they spent time building uh, a nice cross and putting his name on it. So uh, he must have been a popular fellow. Usually they just hang his boots on a tree and the next person might take those boots. Another uh, landmark that you're gonna wanna put into your, uh, your, your hunt for landmarks is this pile of logs that's all grown over. What this is is called a roll away, or what would happen is there's a big flat area uh, where they would store all the logs that this logging camp would have cut and hauled with horses to the flat area where it'd be stored. And then when the spring breakup occurred, they would push the logs into the flowing water down this ramp, and that would get the logs rolling out into the river and, and uh, flowing downstream without getting all jammed up right at the beginning. So see if you can find that roll away. It's in something we call Burnt Island Lake at the end of Little Steel Rapids. The most uh, famous and uh, still well-preserved landmark from the 1870s uh, logging era is the Des Moines Rod and Gun Club. Uh, this is a, 
they welcome your visits. Uh, the Des Moines Rod and Club, Gun Club is an active uh, club that has owned these buildings since 1954. The buildings were built around 1870, I believe. They were built by the uh, Hamilton Lumber Company, who had the major uh, timber limits in this area. And the, the, most, the biggest challenge that the lumber companies had was su supplying their shanty camps so that they could keep uh, eating and living while they did all this difficult work in the winter. So wherever they could find a good spot, they would build a farm, a supply farm. And usually it had a blacksmith shop as well to build, uh, to repair all of their horse harnesses and materials and rehorse, reshoe the horses. So this in 1870 was uh, a supply farm for the Hamilton Lumber Company. And then uh, when they sold their timber limits, uh, they sold the farm to Paul Dufault, the men we mentioned him in the, at the mouth of the Des Moines River. He held on to it for a couple of years and then he sold it to uh, the Sauve family. The Sauve family ran it as one of these stopping places for the Teamsters going up with supplies to the lumber camps. And it was one of the most famous uh, stopping places uh, along the river for a good 30 years because I think the family was a lot of fun. There seemed to be a lot of dancing and partying to and fro as you went up and down the Des Moines at this particular spot. If you get a chance and the root cellar is open, it's a real authentic root cellar where all of the potatoes and turnips and carrots that they used to grow would be stored all winter down there in cold, all summer in cold storage. The, the uh, dovetailing of the logs is just beautiful. So take a half day or try to camp at the campsite provided and explore the Des Moines Club. There's one other interesting building that you should look at on the Des Moines Club site. At the lower right corner is a picture of that building in about uh, 1920. And it was part of a, another uh, lumber depot farm called Rowanton, owned by E.B. Eddy Company. This was such a large farm that they had a school and they had a post office and they had a, uh, this house here would be the family of the uh, general manager of the whole limit. And when it was closed down by E.B. Eddy finally, uh, the Des Moines Rod and Gun Club, uh, a member bought it and disassembled it and moved it to the Des Moines Club and it looked like this. Did a pretty good job of putting it together, but the version of it today, the one in the upper right hand corner in 2022 is a masterpiece. Uh, some uh, Adirondack builders were brought in to build a special chimney for it and make it uh, just a, a beautiful masterpiece today. A uh, piece of uh, preservation of, of history. As you paddle down from the Des Moines Club, there are two sets of rapids, and then you'll come, you'll have to look on your map. You'll come to the old site of Rowanton. There's nothing left there anymore but a clearing, but there used to be a fire tower. And this is a picture inside the fire tower. And I don't know if you can see the ring around the edge of the fire tower and the ring in the middle of the table. But when a fire was sighted, the, uh, the sighting would, uh, just like the rifle sightings on a gun, he would look through here and he would get a bearing of where that fire was. And then he would telephone that location down to where they organized all of the firefighters. It was quite a, quite a special, uh, organization. This whole system existed in uh, from about 1912 to 1965. Of course, the, uh, the grand highlight of the Des Moines River is Grand Chute. And there is so much history here. I really encourage you to, uh, to spend a half a day trying to find it. This is the view from the bridge looking down the river. And this is the view from the first campsite looking up the river. You have to imagine 
along this shoreline here, a whole log chute was built and it's gonna, it looks like this. So this is a picture of the same log, similar log chute uh, that is at the Kalange River. There is no pictures of the one that's at the Des Moines, but I know that the first 300 yards of it looked like this. So what would happen is there'd be about a foot of water flowing here and each log would be sent down one at a time and there'd be enough water that that log would flow around any obstacle like Grand Chute that you wanted to miss. When it reached a certain point, it would, the log chute was taken inland and you can still find the traces of the foundation of this log chute as you see here on the right. And you can still find the spikes that held the base of the log chute here. This is uh, the last picture before the log chute was destroyed. I took this one in about 2009. And this is what the in, inland log chute looked like. So it was a complete logging railroad where the logs would float down uh, with a foot of water in, in a base uh, of uh, flat boards and sides supported on the ground. So this was the longest slide in the world at the time. It was uh, about uh, 3,300 feet. And uh, what we're trying to do today is trace exactly where that log chute went and try to recreate it with photos and then perhaps a little uh, building project to, to give you an idea of what that actually looked like in 1872. When you get to the bottom of the log chute and the bottom of the portage, uh, there is three rapids leading into Robinson Lake. This photograph is very interesting. It was taken at those rapids in 1960. And uh, the last log drive on the river was 1960-61. So it, this is a pointer boat that would have been used to drive the logs down the river. What I like to point to is uh, the fantastic whitewater technique that all of these paddlers had uh, long before we were teaching whitewater canoeing. They really knew how to handle uh, violent water because they lived on it. But notice there's no life jackets, there's no safety of any sort. It was uh, a rough and tumble uh, lifestyle for sure. When you get to the bottom of those rapids, you flow into a flat water section called the Robinson Lake. And there is one cabin there that dates from 1860. You can, it stands out from the others because it's built with huge squared timbers. This is known as the caretaker's cabin. And what it was, was uh, the place where the company foreman, whatever company had the timber rights at the time, the foreman would live here all winter and manage two or three of the shanty camps that were cutting. In the end, the last people to use it were game wardens that would stay all winter in, the, in this camp and look after the property of the Des Moines Club or other clubs in the area. Before the, uh, the large lease clubs were broken up, uh, they were allowed to employ their own game wardens. So this is the Des Moines River Rod and Gun Club. There are several cabins that, of this style that you'll see on the way down. The Des Moines Club was formed in 1918 and they established themselves first on Robinson Lake by building a little lean-to shanty, maybe occupying a shanty that was already there by, from a logging company. And they built all of these trails that you see the dotted line maps in between their different hunting and fishing uh, popular lakes in their lease. They marked the trails by painting these uh, tin lids with one color on the top and white on the bottom. So you knew when you got to a junction, which trail to take. As I said, they had exclusive hunting and fishing rights for a hundred square miles, and they were allowed to enforce the, that law as they saw fit by hiring their own game wardens. This is the bottom of uh, 
this is the Ottawa River again, and I mentioned that the uh, the Des Moines forests in 1912, the the forest industry began to protect um, the forest from forest fires and from invasive uh, bugs like spruce bug budworm. So this company was a collective of all of the uh, timber companies, the Ottawa River Forest Protective Association, and they built in the Ottawa in the Des Moines Valley uh, eleven fire towers. I showed you the picture of this one at Rowanton, and they maintained the old uh, tote road that used to be used as a supply road, as their own uh, way of communicating between all their towers and firefighting stations. The way they communicated was very interesting. They built their own telephone line. So when you walk on our Des Moines hiking trail, which I'll talk about in a minute, you look up in the trees and you see these insulators in the trees that the tree has started to grow around. Well, they put these insulators up there and then they ran a steel line, telephone line, all the way up almost 100 uh, kilometers to Lac Des Moines so that each one of their fire towers could send a message down to headquarters to say, there's a fire here, it's this big, we're gonna need this many men to fight it, let's get into action. So uh, this is a very uh, intricate system that lasted well into the 1960s. That whole uh, a series of forest rangers living in the fire towers and having uh, cabins at the bottom of the fire towers at the nearest lake. Their other assignment was to keep all of the portages and all of the trails open so that if they had to fight a fire, men could move by canoe or wagon or horse to get to the forest fire. <laughs> and it's very interesting to me that uh, all of the forest uh, signs were trilingual. Uh, back in the 1920s. It just tells you that uh, there was a lot of uh, Algonquin traffic in the forest and working in the forest as well. Well, that final era of the Des Moines Club and uh, other clubs of, of similar nature, there was probably 50 clubs in the, uh, in the Pontiac, uh, attracted a, a really well-to-do crowd from uh, New England and Montreal, a few from Toronto as well. But they would take the train up to the uh, stopping place across from the Des Moines River. They're all dressed to the nines. That's why uh, the guides behind their back would call them sports. And they would uh, carry their gear down to the river and they would get on a very crude ferry. This one here is crossing the Ottawa River this one's crossing the Gatineau River. You can see that they pulled themselves across. You have to remember that the Ottawa River before the flood at the narrowest point in Stonecliff was only probably 100 yards wide. So it's very interesting that they could uh, propel a ferry like this to take people across with all of their gear. So when the sports got to the other side, the first stopping place that they could buy a meal and uh, get a guide or stay overnight was Paul Dufo's at the mouth of the uh, Des Moines. And then a, uh, a horse with a load of uh, supplies for a lumber camp could travel about 10 miles in a day. So the next stopping place was at the mouth of the Phil de Grand. It was uh, called Bertrand's. That was the family that ran it. Another 10 miles, there was another camp called Pot Van, and then there was a lumber camp on Robinson Lake that was the stopping place for High Falls. The reason that uh, the, uh, the forest rangers and all of the fire towers were abandoned was that they started to patrol by float plane for all uh, forest fighting patrol and moving firefighters in to fight a fire. So when I first got to the Des Moines in 1969, this plane was there, and that plane lasted until 2005, probably moved about 10,000 people in and out of the Des Moines River. And one pilot for 
90% of the time, Ronnie Bose was the pilot of this particular plane called CFODA. So uh, Ronnie was my inspiration. That was a picture of him as a, when I got there in 1969. This is a picture of him this year. Uh, but he's still my source, my go-to source of knowledge for all uh, fact or fiction about the Des Moines River in, in the last hundred years. So what we've done to try to bring the history to life uh, we being the friends of Des Moines, is we have uh, cleared this old logging road and forestry road that goes all the way up to Des Moines. And uh, we turned it into a hiking trail from Grand Chute all the way down to the Ottawa River. So now you can actually hike up and explore each of the stopping places and each of the River Drive campsites. We've found about 10 of them so far. It really brings the history alive. And uh, it's a different way to look at the Des Moines River. And what we hope is that canoeists will actually hike up and paddle back down. And that way they'll see all the different aspects of the Des Moines River from shore and from, uh, from the river. So you can start your Des Moines trip from several launching points or you can hire this fellow that will take you up to the beginning of the south end or pick you up there. And you can hike up and he will also drive your canoes around to Robinson Lake, that's at 10. And uh, both outfitters will do that, but only a 10 has a boat right now. Friends of Des Moines is something that we started in 2016. And our first project was to try to put a thunder box on each of the campsites on the Des Moines River. And this took on a life of its own because we had so many volunteers volunteering to build the thunder box, paint it, take it into the river, dig the hole, put it on the campsite. And then it's been five years since the first one went in in 2017. And uh, some people have actually moved that first generation to a new hole to keep it uh, working properly. But the artwork that's going on to these has been a real inspiration and uh, a lot of fun. I think you'll enjoy uh, the thunder boxes on the, all of the campsites on the Des Moines River. Uh, Friends of Des Moines is trying to uh, interpret both the history and the nature uh, aspects of the, uh, of the hiking trail that we're talking about. This particular tree measures about uh, 13 feet around, that puts it at about 200 years old. So it was one that this fella didn't get a chance to chop down. And uh, we hope that it uh, lasts as long as it's natural life. And there are several trees along the trail that are at least that big. We also found uh, this log, which is about 35 feet long. It's a squared timber. Uh, it could have been an original squared timber. It could have been part of the log slide around Grand Chute. And when they broke it up uh, after it was, the log slide was no longer required, it just floated down the uh, Red Pine Rapids to uh, a resting site. We've now pulled it out of the river and you can have your morning coffee there on one of the campsites on uh, Red Pine Rapids. As you walk the trail, you're gonna see old stove parts that are part of uh, the farms that used to run as stopping places for the uh, Teamsters in their sleighs. You're gonna see uh, old tools and wash basins. This is a lunchtime fireplace that's on the, uh, on the trail. It's very interesting. The Teamsters would take uh, all of their own food with them and stop whenever their horses needed a rest and make themselves a cup of tea. This is uh, two trees that are at the campsite that's known as Pot Van Farm. This is a yellow birch. It's gotta be over a hundred years old. It's a fantastic tree. And of course, this is a white pine here that's of similar size to the one the girls were hugging. So what we're, we're also excited about is trying to tell you the stories that these trees 
uh, represent all the people that they saw pass up and down the Des Moines by sleigh or canoe. The other spectacular natural landmark on the Des Moines, of course, is something we call Bald Eagle Cliff. I'm sure that's not the original name. We're trying to find the Anishinaabe original name that the Des Moines band would have had for this site. But this, uh, this cliff, we've created a hiking trail up to the top of it. And we plan to create hiking trails to all of the great vistas on the Des Moines. So you'll have a really different perspective of this river and this country. So this is the uh, Bald Eagle Cliff from the far shore, the height of land from the far shore where our trail is. This is the view from the top of Bald Eagle Cliff looking up towards the Fil de Grand. There is a new trail up to the top of that now. This is the same view from here looking down river towards Ryan Chute. And this of course is Bald Eagle Cliff. And uh, we hope that we're turning the Des Moines from uh, a weekend trip to a week long trip where you can enjoy it in many ways, including the history, but also uh, from the shoreline. When you get to the mouth of the Des Moines, this is a painting or a sketch of the Des Moines River done in 1860. And you can see the mouth of the Des Moines. There was a few cabins there, uh, probably belonging to uh, Benjamin Sweezy at the time. There's a, a remnant of a, a, a place that they would tie the boom logs to catch. There would be a large circle of boom logs that would catch all the logs that went down the river and hold them in place for the, uh, for the steamers to pull them down to the next set of rapids. And just where these trees are is a campsite with this huge boom ring on it. Now, this is a nice campsite for you to stop and possibly camp for one more night and just contemplate all the different traffic that went up and down this river. So there were voyagers, there were large pointer boats, there were three generations of lumbermen, square timber, saw logs, and pulp and paper logs, who would walk up into their shanty camps, work all winter, and then do a river drive down to the mouth of Des Moines in the spring. There were thousands of horses used to haul all of the supplies into the uh, shanty camps on the Des Moines. There were canoes and pointer boats used at the mouth to go up the river and to work the river. There was a ferry that would ferry people across, working people, but also sports. There was a steamer that went by and stopped at the mouth of the Des Moines. There was a steamboat, a tugboat that would pull all the logs that were cut down to the next rapids, let them go through the rapids and then pull another steamboat would pull it further down. And of course, there was uh, Ronnie Bow's plane that would uh, take people into the headwaters of Des Moines. So just think of all those different users that are joining you as you paddle your last kilometer of the Des Moines River. This is what the village of Rapid de Shaim looked like in 1872. This is the hotel I mentioned. It was called the Colton Hotel. It was described as the most fantastic hotel this far north on the Ottawa River at the time. And of course, that's the steamboat at the dock delivering people to the Colton Hotel before there was a steamboat above. So this watercolor was done in 1872 for a travel brochure. That travel brochure was called Traveler's Guide to the Upper Ottawa. I just want you to remember that picture there as you drive across the bridge today, this bridge was built in 1902, this section of the bridge anyways. And uh, it is your entrance way to the village today of Rapid Duashim. This is a picture of the village in 1910. And William Murray and brothers were the biggest trading uh, posts in 1910. And this is a view down the river that they would have seen at that time. This is the same view today. 
I'd like to thank Wendy Dean Como for use of this picture. It is spectacular. Thank you very much in three languages. And uh, Jean-Francois and I will uh, attempt to answer any questions that, that you wish to ask. Thank you so much, uh, Wally, for this sharing. It was absolutely uh, amazing. It was quite a trip through uh, history, uh, your pictures and uh, and uh, archives are uh, are uh, remarkable. I can just imagine the huge amount of hours that you should have put in, in, into this. Uh, now I would like to open the floor to uh, people who may want to ask a question. Uh, you may answer your question. Uh, you may ask your uh, question openly with your mic or uh, into the chat of the Zoom. Alors j'inviterai uh, tout le monde. À, à poser vos questions, soit à de vive voix à, avec votre micro ou de poser vos questions dans le fil de discussion. Et puis, je vais les présenter euh, à Wally. OK, so we got uh, well done. Every, uh, everyone is very happy and grateful for this presentation. Um, we have a question, Wally, from a gentleman. Uh, I think his name is Sébastien Corville. He is asking, was the Dumont Ben mainly settled on Kwabi Island? Um, Kwabi Island is uh, an island in the middle of Lac Des Moines. And the name, the family name Kwabi is actually part of uh, the Manawaki Band. So uh, no, uh, yes and no, there was a lot of mixing of the families later in the history and uh, uh, obviously the the Kwabi family uh, used that as a as a summer place but uh, it's not one of the very first names that is associated with the Des Moines band. And uh, Wally, I, I wanted to ask you as well, I know that you're leading a lot of the preservation the pro uh, projects and you are working to rebuild uh, the, the uh, hiking trails network. Um, I was wondering how can people get in touch with you if they want to contribute uh, either as voluntary work or contribute in some other capacity? Uh, where should they go? Is there a website? Do you have an address? Um, do you have an email or? Um. Yeah, the, the uh, email that we use is Des Moines River, all small letters, at primus.ca. We have a Facebook page, which is called Form Friends of Riviera Des Moines. You could join or you could just join me on my Facebook page and I could, uh, I could link you to work. We, we have uh, several volunteers that work in small groups of four to six and uh, they usually have an experienced person with them. Uh, we don't have time really to, uh, uh, you know, to look after people on these trips. Everybody has to be self-sufficient, uh, but uh, it's really a lot of fun if you do participate in a, in a trail clearing project or history rebuilding project. Okay, and we have two other questions, uh, Wally. Um... We have a question from Peter. Can you describe how you are developing a relationship with, with the Wolf Lake uh, First Nation? Uh, is, are there uh, any talks of ethical uh, tourism? And the second question is um, about the hiking trail. How long is it and how difficult it is? Um, and uh, how, what is the level of, of uh, canoeing for this uh, river? Is it accessible for beginners or intermediary and, and so on? So these are the two questions. Okay, the first question was, uh, are we developing a relationship with Wolf Lake First Nation? Yes, we're, we're really working hard on getting the history right of the uh, families that are specifically related to this section of the Des Moines the Fildegrand family and the Ponis family. 
and we really hope to celebrate by uh, having a, a really nice uh, information panel describing their role in the, in the area in the uh, in the history. Uh, we hope that uh, Wolf Lake finds a, a, a way to uh, offer uh, some sort of unique uh, uh, trip that is hiking that uh, perhaps describes their history in the area or maybe their edible uh, wilds uh, alternatives so, or maybe their, uh, their own version of an art camp. There's, there's lots of uh, exciting opportunities we hope we can de develop with them. The hiking trail is uh, 26 kilometers long. Um, it can be done in two days, three days, as long as you want, five days. It has uh, a good 12 beautiful campsites on them. And these campsites are brand new. They were built not to compete with canoeists. Uh, a lot of the campsites are at uh, places that relate to the history of the trail, not the river. So I think you'd really enjoy it. The uh, trail can be done as a day trip and you can go back to your car to camp for at least the first five kilometers, maybe 10 kilometers. The bottom of the trail, the first five kilometers is accessible by boat. So you could actually take a canoe or a kayak or even a motorboat up to our campsites and start hiking that way and stay overnight at the campsite or go back to your own campsite at Driftwood Park or your cottage, for example. Uh, the degree of difficulty, most of the trail is quite, uh, I would say flat. It, the base of it is on an old logging road. There were, we felt two important portages to include in the trail. So the portage around Grand Chute and the portage around Red Pine Rapids are typical rocky granite portages that are super interesting, but a little more difficult than the, than the logging road. And uh, we, we will have a map, a trail map uh, by the spring. Uh, we're officially opening the trail uh, in Labor Day of this year but we're encouraging uh, experienced groups to try to use it and tell, uh, tell us what they think of it uh, starting this spring. Okay, thank you so river, much, uh, Wyatt. Okay, the river itself uh, is, I would say, uh, more advanced than the, than the Noir, possibly the Kalunj. So uh, you would want to, if you're starting at Lac Des Moines, you would want to have pretty good whitewater skills. If you're starting at Robinson Lake, I would consider it a class two rapids that you can portage the difficult sets and enjoy the river. Great. Yeah, uh, I confirm I have done this uh, river for the first time this year and I confirm that it's uh, some of the of the rapids are not uh, are more uh, intermediate, but they are quite uh, easy to uh, portage or uh, the trails are quite nice. And uh, Wally, you are getting a lot of kudos in the comments. Uh, Karen says, great presentation. I love the old maps and photos. Um, Tizzy says, thank you for the very interesting presentation. Mia says, uh, thank you so much, uh, Wally. The work you do is so incredible. Um, we also have a question from Frederica, who is asking, uh, where can we find the hiking uh, maps? Uh, and uh, we also have a few other questions. Um, is there a website where we can find all these information for to plan a canoe trip? Maybe give uh, the, the details of the shuttle uh, service in which you are a partner with. Uh, the, he is an amazing guy. And uh, these are the two questions. Okay, uh, I just finished a piece, uh, a descriptive piece for a new website that's starting. Um, Derek, uh, I think Derek is a member of the, uh, Derek Lewis, a member of uh, the club, I'm not sure. Uh, the, the website's going to be called paddle.ca. 
it'll be all about the canoe routes in the Ottawa Valley. And my, uh, my contribution was the Des Moines River with as up-to-date information about shuttles and different uh, options as, as I could find, including pictures. So uh, we'll get that posted on your uh, club uh, website, the link to that as soon as it's live. And, uh, and that will give you the most up-to-date information. Uh, we're all volunteers and we just, uh, we just work as much as we can to get this done. Uh, we have a group that's looking after producing a map. The map you see on the screen right now is uh, a map that is available, but we will be expanding this map. And uh, each kilometer on this map has a kilometer marker. And there are other kilometers, there are other markers that guide you along the trail. So uh, uh, I would say that it won't be that difficult for you to navigate by, uh, by this summer, July. And uh, we will try to have a map that we will post online at all the different clubs that, that you can download. And Wally, we're just uh, getting uh, dozens of, co of positive comments to uh, thank you. Uh, uh, someone says, thank you, Wally, great presentation. Diane Lemire says, great presentation, amazing research and information. Really great presentation. Um, so I think that we have, we're mostly done with the questions and thank you so much, uh, Wally, for uh, uh, keeping this presentation going for nearly 90 minutes. Um, <laughs> So I think that, uh, oh, there's a last question. Where is the access points near the Mount of the Dumoine, near the old cabin? A question from Paula. Where is the access point near the old cabin? Uh, uh, well, that was two questions. If you look at, can you see the map that's on my screen now? Uh, the, the places on the Ottawa River that are uh, places you can launch your canoe from, and paddle over to the south end of the trail are Stone Cliff, Pine Valley, Morning Mist, and Driftwood Provincial Park. It's about a two kilometer paddle to the start of the trail. And uh, at the below Grand, the, the north end of the trail begins right at Grand Chute Bridge. You'll see, you'll see a sign marker right there that says kilometer zero. And you can follow the trail, uh, trail markers uh, all the way down to Robinson Lake. The old cabin that I mentioned is right at the beginning of this lake here, Robinson Lake, and it's at kilometer four. Super, and Derek, um, and Derek uh, Lawless has put the link from paddle.ca uh, with the Dumoine uh, River, and I think it's your personal blog of, uh, of, uh, of a summary that you provided with lots of uh, information. Um, we have a final question. Is the start of the trail visible from the river? Well, it, um, the north start of the trail is visible because you have to get out in Portage Grand Chute. So the from north the Ottawa the trail, River? From the Ottawa River, uh, yes, you'll see that we built a campsite and you, there's a little dock that, that we have there with a sign. By the, by the end of the summer, we hope to have a major sign there explaining what the trail is about and what the history of the mouth of the river is about, especially the uh, Algonquin history. It's so exciting. So uh, you have to bear with us for about another four months. And uh, the trail is, is definitely usable now. Uh, the trail will be really exciting by the end of this summer. And uh, well, yeah, I think that the uh, amount of work that you and volunteers have done is uh, remarkable. And I would invite uh, people as well who would like to do some voluntary work when they come for ex an expedition or just to come hike and uh, volunteer to uh, contact you and uh, you, you mentioned that you can find ways where people can be integrated into uh, voluntary work, activities, and current uh, projects uh, on the way. Um, so I think that we are done with the questions. And Wally, thank you so much for the generosity of your time in, 
in making this absolutely be beautiful uh, presentation and uh, in, sh in uh, sharing it uh, with us. Uh, so thank you. Is there any anything that you would like uh, to add as a final word of wisdom or? Uh... Uh, well, my, my message is always the same at the end of the uh, presentation. This is such a uh, valuable wilderness resource and wilderness is getting more and more valuable that you have a responsibility if you are going to participate in this to really be uh, as low an impact uh, a camper uh, as you can. But I want you to have a high impact in spending money locally so that local people will value preservation of wilderness because they know it can lead to uh, a livelihood for them. So uh, it's a two edged sword. Spend some money locally in the village before you go and maintain your own impact down to a very minimum. Thanks very much.